It's time for Fed Talk, the live show for Feds in the Know. From federal agencies to Capitol Hill, the attorneys of Shaw, Bransford, and Roth bring in experts from across the federal community to bring you inside the issues. Fed Talk is meant to provide general information about legal issues. However, the views expressed in this program are not intended to provide legal counseling. Listeners are cautioned not to rely upon any statements made in resolving legal issues they may face, but instead to consult with their own attorney about specific situations. Attorneys are not engaged in providing legal services while appearing on the program and are not responsible in any manner for the consequences that may stem directly or indirectly from reliance on any statement made during this program. Good morning and welcome to Fed Talk. I'm your host, uh, Ben Carnes, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, and I'm joined here in studio uh, by uh, two leading thinkers in D.C. who are uh, working on governance issues, and more specifically working on governance issues relating to uh, how Congress might better perform its duties and uh, better better fulfill its uh, original uh, constitutional mission. Um, Kathy Goldschmidt is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Congressional Management Foundation. Uh, she's worked with CMF for 20 years after working in the House of Representatives. Uh, she's worked on uh, numerous projects for CMF, including the Resilient Democracy uh, Coalition and Congress 3.0. Most recently, though, uh, she authored a major report released by CMF titled State of the Congress, Staff Perspectives on Institutional Capacity in the House and Senate, which presents the results of surveys of uh, senior congressional staffers regarding how well-equipped they feel their bosses, uh, the members, and their fellow staff members are uh, to carry out their duties. Uh, Kathy, thanks for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. And my other guest is uh, a former colleague from the R Street Institute uh, Free Market Think Tank here in D.C. He's currently the Vice President of Policy at R Street, where he wears a number of hats. Uh, kind of a, as an aside, he recently authored a new book, A Moonshine, A Global History, <laughs> as part of uh, uh, his work on some of R Street's regulatory policy uh, relating to alcohol markets. But more relevantly for the discussion today, he heads the organization's governance program, uh, which is adopted the tongue-in-cheek model. I don't know if it's official, make Congress great again. Uh, and also runs the Legislative Capacity Branch Working Group, which meets monthly on Capitol Hill to discuss ideas for improving congressional capacity and effectiveness. Uh, and both of us, uh, both, both of them are, are with us in the studio today, and uh, thanks for, for being here. Um, I guess I want to, it might just be a great opportunity, uh, you know, saw budget news uh, here in the last little bit, and just sort of uh, as, as we ease into some of these discussions. Um, it seems like sort of a, an interesting lens through which to look at some of these congressional capacity issues. But, uh, you know, we just had, uh, I believe it was $1.5 trillion in tax cuts that are, are sort of in play with the, the Senate budget measure. And a lot of those negotiations, I think they took place, the bulk of them over the course of about 36 hours. And um, how, you know, I, we were talking briefly before we came on the air, but I, I think that seems to sort of get at some of the the, the foundational issues of um, at least what, what the public sort of feels frustrated about um, and certainly probably what staff feel frustrated about, which is just the amount of work and, and of policy relating to, to these huge sweeping pieces of legislation. Um, and I guess, uh, Kevin, if you could give, can you give sort of an overview of some of the work the uh, legislative capacity group is doing the governance uh, project at R Street is doing um, in in trying to address uh, some of those issues, um, and you're seeing that in play right now, obviously on on Capitol Hill. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the the mere fact that the Senate voted on a budget resolution is actually uh, big news because most years we don't get a budget resolution. Yep. Um, both houses don't bother to vote on it and nor bother to go and actually reconcile it, but it, but it happened. And that's important because it, uh, the budget resolution is a spending plan. Uh, but whether or not this resolution actually amounts to anything is, is to be seen because the House and the Senate are just so radically far apart, um, which is part of the process, the process that was set up 40 years ago, which um, doesn't work so hot. Um, it basically pits the House versus the Senate and the Congress collectively against the president. And it's not surprising that our, our budget's uh, been uh, a mess uh, for years and years. But getting your question about uh, uh, the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group, this is a, a gathering that uh, our Street Institute put together with our friends on the left, New America, um, out of a shared concern that Congress simply was not equipped 
uh, to do all the things that we demand of it. I mean, you think about the sheer size of the federal budget, more than $4 trillion for which Congress is supposed to appropriate that money and to decide where it goes and to oversee it. And this goes into all, you know, on top of all their other duties, approving treaties, you know, uh, approving nominees for high jobs in the administration, passing laws on other stuff. It's a ton of work to do. We look at Congress and um, we feel that as a, just as an entity, the work is way bigger than it can possibly accomplish. And so we hold regular meetings. It's a left, right, center, transpartisan sort of gathering to try to think about Congress as an organization and how um, it might be upgraded so that it can just better work. And there's a, I actually pulled a, a roll call piece here um, where the Congressional Management Foundation and uh, R Street both uh, sort of contributed to this, this short story from 2015. I outline some of the numbers uh, and just, just for some perspective, uh, there's a statistic here that it goes back to 2005 that 49% of personal uh, house office staffers worked in Washington, uh, which is down from 62% in 1985, uh, you know, congressional staff moving out to the uh, district and state offices. And sort of more to the point uh, that the average house member in 2010 represented almost 711,000 people. Uh, whereas in 1970, that number was about 300,000 less. It was uh, 469,000. So the, the uh, and as I understand it, the, the, the cap on staff level has, levels has not changed. So you have just this incredible, almost doubling of, in sheer number of, of people represented. Uh, and I know the Cong Congressional Management Foundation has, has sort of uh, sought to to come at that um, from some different angles. How do you, how do you even begin to, equip staffers with with what they need um, when you have the same number of people and, and literally a doubling and you, you factor in, you know, the uh, the rise of email and the how, how much easier it is to, to express your opinion to your members. Um, where, where do you even start? <laughs> to... uh, you try to train them to prioritize, to use technology effectively, um, as, they, as effectively as they can, um, to manage more effectively, um, but it is an uphill battle, and um, the internet and email have, you know, not only have their districts and and states populations increased, the email and the internet has made it much easier for everybody to communicate with them, and so they are receiving a, a deluge, a constant deluge, um, including there's a, a massive increase in the first quarter of this year, uh, in response to the new administration. Um, and it's very hard for them to manage and to hear what's being said by their constituents. And it's also virtually impossible for them to proactively reach out and seek input because they're so busy reacting to it. And I just sort of for context, I um, spent seven years on Capitol Hill. And I think both of you have some some level of Capitol Hill background as well. I know, Kevin, you were at uh, CRS, Congressional Research Service. Uh, I don't know if you spent any time actually working in uh, no, staff level. And then, Kathy, you were on, uh, I saw in your bio, you were on the House of Representatives. I'm not sure uh, what, what your actual... Personal office staff. Personal <laughs> office. So, I, I mean, I assume those experiences are very personally instructive in uh, in, in being able to, to see those problems. I know uh, when I was on the Hill, there, there was always this, this feeling a little bit, uh, and we talked about it off the air, of just sort of as a staff member working in press, writing speeches and that sort of thing, feeling a little bit unprepared to, you know, uh, to need to, to know just so much um, because of the, the committee assignments and the various responsibilities. I, mean, I know the CMF, the Congressional Management Foundation, has sought to sort of come at that by, by actually equipping uh, congressional staff, which is seemingly obvious, but, but really uh, kind of wasn't being done. And what are some of the ways that you guys are doing that. Can you tell us a little bit about CMF's uh, initiatives to actually educate congressional staff and equip them? Sure. We, um, we focus on Congress as an institution, and we help train them in their jobs, give them skills they need in their jobs. So we don't focus on policy at all um, and don't train them you know, in how to, how to seek out policy information, which is one of the challenges that they face. Um, but we help them understand kind of what the role of a legislative assistant is, for example, or what a, a staff assistant or an intern needs to know in order to be most effective and help the office, because they are integral parts of the offices. You know, every every person on staff, um, 
from the intern to the chief um, is really an integral part of the staff and needs to contribute. And so we try to make their ramp up to become effective as, as fast as possible. And then a lot of what we do is focus on um, helping the managers, the chiefs of staff and the legislative directors in a personal office um, be better managers. You know, they come in, they're put in charge of essentially a small business. People forget that Congress isn't actually you know a single body, really. It's a collection of um, small businesses. And um, people who come in aren't usually from a business background or an HR background. They're from a political background. And they get charge, put in charge of staff and budgeting. And um, we help them understand how to be the most effective managers they can be so that their offices are as effective as possible. And I, I want to drill into that a little bit more. Uh, we have to take just a quick break. And when we come back, we'll continue our conversation. Uh, you're listening to Fed Talk on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. And I will be right back after a word from our sponsor. Make long-term care insurance part of your retirement plan. Long-term care is expensive, and it's not covered by traditional types of insurance plans. With benefits designed specifically for the federal family, the Federal Long-Term Care Insurance Program offers a smart way to help protect savings and assets and remain independent should you need long-term care services someday. Start planning for the future. Take the next step and visit ltcfeds.com today. That's ltcfeds.com. Welcome back to Fed Talk. Uh, I'm your host, Ben Carnes, on uh, Federal News Radio 1500 AM. And we're joined today uh, by a couple of uh, minds, policy experts working in D.C. on uh, issues relating to congressional capacity and how we can better equip Congress to uh, to do its job uh, more efficiently. And, and before the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, the fact that the, the cap on the number of congressional staff in an office has not changed, despite the fact that members are on average representing uh, nearly double uh, the, the number of constituents, a wider range of issues. And the Congressional Management Foundation obviously coming at it a little bit through through training and just actually equipping the individual uh, staff members. Um, I know, Kevin, you had written uh, a piece restoring Congress as the first branch. And I guess sort of the broad question I, I keep going back to, you know, we look at the, the budget and the, the overwhelming workload. And uh, aside from sort of the major component of actually giving staff members what they need, whether it be the money and the resources. I mean, are there, what are the ways that you can begin addressing, uh, you know, I just I, even I'm curious as a former congressional staffer, what are the ways you can go to these staff members and say, you know, here, here are changes, like actual tangible changes that we can begin making to make the process work better. And um, uh, just in your research, are there uh, sort of key elements that, that you can begin chipping away at uh to, to begin fixing some of the, some of the issues that we see, I mean, what are some of those? Well, yeah, there are so many aspects of Congress's current operations which are just not up to snuff. That you can start with some really small ball stuff, or you can go big. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the small ball stuff um, doesn't require a law. Congress can simply adopt it as a policy. The individual members in their offices can adopt uh, changes as a policy. Um, but the big challenge is getting people to even think on Capitol Hill that things can change. I, uh, I've been in this town since 2003 and all, all this time has been uh, spent interacting with congressional staff and members of Congress. And my sense is that there's a kind of learned helplessness, a, mm -hmm. a sense that you know, people get to Congress and they look around and say, this is the way the place runs. Oh, okay. There's nothing I can do about it. I just have to cope in this environment. And so they struggle through and they gripe. Um, and then, you know, eventually they wear down and decide that they're going to, going to leave. Um, and a number of members of Congress have resigned in recent years, uh, not because they were afraid of being primary. They were just worn out by the um, exasperating environment. And so what we're trying to do is to encourage them to you know, first realize that you can fix things. Um, and if you start with the small ball stuff, you might get some little wins. Uh, for example, uh, last, uh, last year, uh, the um, uh, Congress decided to appropriate a little bit more money to pay congressional staff. Um, this was a glaring problem for years. The cost of living in D.C. has skyrocketed. 
uh, staff pay was held flat. So when adjusted for inflation, people who are whose salaries 15 years ago may have been modest were actually paltry. Um, people had to move way out in the suburbs mm-hmm. and have long commutes, and it was just a miserable grind of an experience, which contributed to staff turnover. Mm-hmm. So Congress freed up the purse a little bit. I mean, in like a rounding error. Mm-hmm. Uh, to have a little bit more money for staff. It was like a little baby step, and they did it. Um, there's, but there's any number of things that can be addressed to make the situation better. Yeah, Kathy? Um, in, in a bigger way, there's also um, a resolution that was introduced by Representatives LaHood and Lipinski, and it has about 70 co-signers now mm-hmm. in the House of Representatives um, to form a joint committee on the organization of Congress, which has happened about every 20 years for the last 100 years in Congress, where Congress forms a committee of um, members from represented from the House and the Senate to investigate itself um, and react to big changes in society. There hasn't been one since the 1990s, and that one coincided with the um, Republican, ta- the big Republican takeover. Um, and so not a lot came of it. And um, Congress really hasn't exec- examined itself since the internet came along. Um, and you know, a lot of big changes were made in the 1970s through the Joint Committee then, and we're kind of seeing unintended consequences from that that probably need to be investigated now. So, I just want to add, um, there's this popular misconception, um, and I've seen to survey data to... to prove it, that a lot of Americans look at Congress and they think, oh, these fat cats with their cushy jobs and they're being shunted about in limousines and they've got all sorts of young staff who are, you know, beholden to them and waiting on them hand and foot Mm -hmm. and that, you know, people in Washington on the Hill are just kind of sitting around waiting for something to do. And that is the exact opposite of the truth. Um, over the last 40 years, the number of congressional staff has gone down. The number of hours that members of Congress spend flying back and forth from Washington, D.C. to their home districts and home states has skyrocketed, which is really rough and also means mm-hmm. if you're flying home, you can't be here governing. Um, the workload has gone through the ceiling. I mean, the size of the budget has what? quintupled or something like that since the 1970s and the staff's gone down. Mm -hmm. And so you put those things together and what you have is a lot of people on Capitol Hill who are utterly overwhelmed, utterly stressed out, frustrated, miserable, and feeling like they're trying to, you know, push a boulder up a mountain. Mm -hmm. Um, And Congress's budget, the amount that it spends on itself and to keep up the capital and like keep up the capital grounds is minuscule. It is a teeny, teeny amount. Congress has this habit of being so paltry with the money it spends on itself, but it allows money to flow to the executive branch like crazy. Uh, It's a really strange situation, and I think most Americans would be shocked if (laughs) they realized that that's how it really is. Yeah, I uh, I, just from my my personal experience on the Hill, I I started when I was, I think, you know, 23, 24, fledgling congressional staffer, and was amazed by many things, one of them being how many people were the same age, uh, these in their early 20s congressional staffers, and just the extent to which this lofty, you know, in Capitol Hill, uh, Congress is, is really run by uh, a lot of young staffers. But you, you begin to realize the, the hellacious work pace and the, 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 the low pay that, you know, uh, but that inevitably would, would turn into, and I assume you must encounter this in your work, anytime you begin talking about congressional pay increases and that sort of thing, it immediately becomes uh, political and you have you have exactly that that conception i remember taking calls uh, and being told as this 24 year old underpaid staffer that oh you well you're just a fat cat government employee sitting and i, I decidedly was not <laughs> um but how you even begin to cut through that i mean what do you do as the congressional management foundation as the r street institute um do you do you worry about the politics of it all or or you do do you just focus on the, the policy and and hope that it eventually trickles down. How do you, that, that to me, maybe that's a million dollar question, but it, it. Well, part of what CMF does is to help the public understand what Congress really is like and how to better communicate with it. So we 
I think since 2014, we've interacted with about 10,000 um, citizens through the um, corporations, nonprofits, and associations that they're affiliated with to train them um, to understand things like this. You know, when you go to Capitol Hill for a lobby day, you're likely to meet with a, you know, an average age 27-year-old legislative assistant. Mm -hmm. or, that's a House um, office um, legislative assistant in the Senate. It's closer to the low, uh, low 30s. But it's still a young person, um, probably not the representative or the senator because, not because they don't care, but because mm -hmm. they have lots of other things going on. Their schedule, as Kevin mentioned, is uh, insane. They have three meetings, you know, an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as you said, they're not very well paid. Just so you know, the average a uh, pay of a house legislative assistant is about the same as a D.C administrative assistant or construction worker. It's about the same wow. amount. Um, and, and the cap for salaries on Capitol Hill is 174000 which sounds like a lot. You know, when you're out in the district, it's not a lot in D.C. It's about what the average attorney makes in D.C. So they're... They're not fat cats. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I mean, carrying that, me you, you, it, that's not the message you're carrying back to your district. I mean, <laughs> that we, well, we have it so hard in DC. Obviously you, you, you can't do that. Um, uh, but I just, just from DC, I remember that there was a, a report maybe a year back that the, I, I think in order to break even in DC, the, the average salary you had to make was about 106,000, you know, to get to a point where it was uh, not paycheck to paycheck. So you end up with, I've heard the term used, uh, the congressional brain drain, where you just, the, the people are, are there. And then that, that's why you have this sort of process of developing experience. And then once you get enough experience, you jump ship and you go somewhere where you can actually make money and have a livelihood. Yeah. And I think that's, um, that's a message that um, we've tried to get out in the media in hopes that it, it would be transmitted to the public that, the choice is you can have uh, competent, professional members of Congress and their staff writing legislation, or you can have lobbyists. Mm -hmm. Take your pick. Um, the system we have right now basically ensures lobbyist dominance on many issues because guess what? Lobby shops pay a lot of money, and you know who they like to hire? people who worked on Capitol mm -hmm. Hill as congressional staff or as committee staffer. So, yeah, you can either, you know, staff up and have more people on the Hill who know what they're doing, who are well paid, who don't feel like they're being run into the ground uh, and not allowed to have a life. Um, I mean, these people really are chained to their desks. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them just like don't ever have having families because they just don't have time. Um, you can keep that sort of dysfunctional approach to governing and, you know, let lobbyists have, you know, rampant influence over legislation. Or, you know, you can put some money towards hiring people who um, who can do the job and be responsive to the American public. But it's important to remember that, that these people aren't mostly coming in to, you know, serve and leave and go make a lot of money mm -hmm. as a lobbyist. They are people who are very interested in public service, and the you know, same is true with members of Congress. They want to do good by the country. Um, they have a much higher commitment and I, I kind of idealistic focus than the average um, worker in the United States and, and attachment to their job, but it's just a rough environment and and as Kevin said, really hard to stay and and almost impossible to have a family. I know when I left the hill it took quite uh quite quite a while before i didn't feel guilty for sitting down at a table for lunch anymore <laughs> i was just you know so accustomed to just having lunch at my desk and so i i remember in those positions it was there were definitely instances where i would i would be more than happy as the one person uh handling this set of responsibilities to to have you give me some product that, that was already written whether that and that, that inevitably leads into the arms of of lobbyists and that it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a uh, it was something uh, scandalous or it, we probably already agreed with that particular you know perspective maybe but it ends up putting the responsibility in the hands of of people because you just have to, to get the work has to be done still and you end up relying on on somebody else to do it um and i think we're going to probably stop here uh, for for a quick break and we'll continue the conversation uh, when we get back and thanks for listening to fed talk federal news radio 1500 a.m 
Make long-term care insurance part of your retirement plan. Long-term care is expensive, and it's not covered by traditional types of insurance plans. With benefits designed specifically for the federal family, the Federal Long-Term Care Insurance Program offers a smart way to help protect savings and assets and remain independent should you need long-term care services someday. Start planning for the future. Take the next step and visit ltcfeds.com today. That's ltcfeds.com. If you're a federal manager, you deal with a lot of information. Here's a tip on breaking through the noise. Join the Federal Managers Association to have a voice on Capitol Hill. And to get filtered news and information specific to managing your workforce, join the 50,000 other federal managers who already subscribe and read the free weekly e-report, fedmanager.com. I'm Todd Wells, Executive Director of the Federal Managers Association, and I approve this message. And welcome back. You're listening to Fed Talk on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm your host, Ben Carnes, and I'm joined today by Kevin Kosar of the R Street Institute, who has the governance project there, and Kathy Goldschmidt of the uh, Congressional Management Foundation. And we're talking about congressional capacity and how Congress can continue to do its job uh, despite uh, diminishing resources and uh, increased responsibilities that, that tends to lead to gridlock. And I'm kind of curious, uh, and part of this, this is also maybe personal curiosity or just just attempting to understand what some of these changes would look like. But I mean, going back to this roll call uh, piece, I was fascinated to see the actual numbers presented. Uh, actually, it was the Congressional Management Foundation, uh, your organization, Kathy, that found uh, that in 2011, constituent correspondence had increased an average of 548% in Senate offices between 2002 and 2010, and 158% in House offices. So again, that's uh, the staff cap remaining the same, 550% increase in correspondence. And it, there was always a sense in anywhere I worked that the legislative correspondent uh, in any congressional office was was probably the most underappreciated person in the office. Um, and it, that, that was a question for us in the office. How do you you have this, you can't afford to pay them too much more. I mean, maybe you can, you know, you have some wiggle room, but how do you deal with a 550% percent increase in correspondence just just as as a legislative correspondent or as a congressional office how can you how do you do that while also you know having the expectation that you communicate effectively that the the constituent feel like you know you're 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 talking to them as if they're their best friend and responding personally and and how do you juggle that are there are there actual best practices you can implement or (laughs) what what is what does that look like and it's management it's using technology effectively um it's training the legislative correspondent really well and kind of impressing on that person who didn't come in wanting to answer the mail they Mm -hmm. came in wanting to be a policy staffer and is working you know they're working toward being policy staffers um, but making sure that they really understand how important that role is in understanding constituent sentiment and helping you know, be, be one component of um, the, the many things that a member has to use to make good policy decisions. Um, but the connection between a member of Congress and his or her constituents is the, the very most important democratic relationship out there. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> that person needs to be uh, well trained and um, and to understand how important they are. And just just prior to the the show, we were talking a little bit, Kevin. I know you mentioned, um, and, and as you mentioned, there there are so many aspects of it. Whether you talk about the, you know the way committees are operating or the way particular pieces of legislation are being brought up, you had mentioned that uh, I, I guess the Senate Rules Committee had had uh, a pretty dramatic shakeup recently, where where there were some changes there and. Um, Obviously, the the rules process is, is fundamental to uh, to the process of getting getting laws passed. Uh, can, can you can you speak to that a little bit and some of the the efforts that um, R Street is is taking on that? Sure. Um, it, one of the longstanding practices uh, in both the House and the Senate is that a a chairman of a committee and the minority party's highest person, the ranking member, have uh, near absolute say over staffing decisions. Um, This is not a civil service type environment. Uh, It's an absolute at will environment. And 
what we see sometimes is that unfortunately that authority is um, used a bit too much aggressively or even abused. Um, we were doing a little bit of digging and we found uh, astonishingly that the uh, Senate Rules and Administration Committee, which has a number of important responsibilities, over the last year, more than half of the people who work there were shown the door. Um, which, when you think about it, like how could any organization with duties and day-to-day -day work to move, how can it function when you have staff turnover like that? Um, the answer is it's going to struggle mightily to do so. But that's what chairmen are allowed to do. Um, and that's one of those sort of processes or uh, internal to Congress that can be fixed. You don't need a law to change that. Um, committees uh, in the House, there's another rule that I've argued is not wise. Uh, Republicans adopt a rule some years ago where they said anyone who becomes chairman of a committee can only st stay there for what, six years? Does that sound right, okay. Kathy? Mm -hmm. um, and then they have to rotate off the committee. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, well, we don't want people getting too comfortable and becoming kind of uh, lords of the dominion, you know, sitting atop the agriculture committee or something like that for 40 years and dominating everything. We don't, you know, that opens the door to corruption and iron triangles and things like that. So they adopted this policy, but think about the incentives. You're brought into a job, which is extremely demanding, and then you're told, no matter how good you do it, you're out in six years. So what do chairmen do? Well, they tend to not want to do the really hard mm -hmm. oversight and the gritty work of governance. It's much easier to be like, you know, I got to set myself up for my next committee position. So I'm going to please political leadership and I'm going to use my chairmanship grandstand to hold show hearings and circus type hearings uh, that track lots of media. And that's what we see a lot these days. And I know uh, our street is actually working uh, uh, sort of relatedly on uh, uh, on some similar uh, similar projects. I, I'm, I'm curious, it, it seems because there, there are sort of two sides to it. There's um, we talked about the public perspective, which is that the Congress is, is filled with these fat cats who are you know, overpaid, et cetera. As you're, you're working with uh, congressional offices in both of your organizations, do you encounter the political concerns from the members? Because I, it seems like there was certainly a willingness to some degree to sort of just fall on the sword. I mean, because you can't go back to the district and say, I gave myself a pay raise, I gave my staff a pay raise. And so a lot of times there seemed to be this mentality of well, it's just, just politically, it's just not an option. We can't do it. So almost uh, an unwillingness to improve <laughs> their own situation because it would potentially cost them their job. And uh, is, is, are there, do you encounter that? And how do you sort of combat that uh, hesitation, I guess, to, to actually fix the problems. There, there are these simple sort of mm -hmm. fixes and, and maybe a, a lack of a desire to actually do so lest it be mischaracterized. Well, some of the, the fixes are things that Americans don't care about, like the stuff involving the chairmanship. That's not, mm -hmm. Americans don't care one way or another, and Congress can just do that on its own. On stuff that is more politically salient, like pay, we, you, you got to recognize that. You, mm -hmm. you know, you sound like a fool talking to elected officials yeah. uh, and their staff if you're not grounded in the reality. So you look for other options. And one option is uh, rather than necessarily hiring a bunch of more personal staff or a member of Congress, you look to staff increasing the staff on congressional committees. They're the ones who are supposed to be responsible for policy. That's mm -hmm. where the real policy depth of knowledge is supposed to be. That's not nearly as politically salient. And you can't accuse an individual member of trying to like spend the money on himself. It's going sure. to this committee that's separate from him. Um, or you look at uh, putting money towards the organizations, the civil servant organizations that support Congress, the nonpartisan people at Government Accountability Office, Congressional Research Service, Congressional Budget Office. The public doesn't get upset if those agencies get a bit more funding for experts who can help Congress govern more smartly. Also, for, um, from a fiscal responsibility perspective, um, the weaker Congress is, the more out of control the executive can get because Congress is supposed to do oversight. And if it doesn't have the capacity to perform oversight on the executive branch, the executive branch gets bigger and bigger and um, possibly less effective and efficient and certainly less overseen um, than it really should be. Um, 
right now the entire legislative branch is one half of one percent of the discretionary spending wow. um and that's to you know oversee the entire executive branch so it's unbelievable there there, there was uh, also in this uh, roll call piece um uh, sort of interesting the, the the tentacles and the way they reach out and i know kevin you were at the congressional research service briefly and in this piece uh, from 2015 just happens to mention that during your time there, uh, that you had hit 660 CRS. Is it CRS reports that you actually authored in in a single year? Requests. Re oh, 660 so requests that you had requests to... from Congress for assistance on various policy issues in a single year. I mean, my, my first question is just how, <laughs> you know, how, how you how you tackle 660 requests. Just knowing how in depth the the CRS re requests often tend to be and the research that goes into them. Um, but it certainly seems to be one of those unintended consequences of even these support mechanisms that staff would would rely on. I have a question, I need information. Okay, I'll call CRS. Well, the guy over at CRS is is he's got number six hundred on his his plate for the year, um, and uh, so it just sort of seems to be the uh, you know Kathy in your in your report uh, the the first finding uh, when you interviewed senior staffers. Uh, was that Congress needs to improve staff knowledge, skills, and abilities, and you know I think CRS probably probably you know plays into that. Um, I, I guess obviously CMF's trainings uh, that you actually do on the Hill are, are part of that. How are how are you you tackling that uh, number one sort of as listed in your your report number one challenge? Well, so our our focus is on the personal office staff. Uh, we don't do training for the institutional offices or for for committees. Um, and you know the institutional staff, the CRSs, the Congressional Budget Office, the Government Accountability Office, which are all part of the legislative branch. Those people are longer tenured and do develop expertise. And so, there's you know people become experts and can answer questions quickly. Six hundred sixty is still a lot. Um, <laughs> but uh, from the personal office staff perspective, it's giving them an idea of. What, what their resources are, what their you know primary focus needs to be, how to help um, maximize their time and their effectiveness and and support the member effectively. And the problem with staff knowledge, skills, and abilities, it's not that these people are not brilliant. I mean, the, the, the workforce on Capitol Hill are very bright people, but not very experienced people. As we talked about, they're coming in as interns getting hired um, as you know in the early 20s and by the time you know, they build up expertise they want to go have a family <laughs> and so um, it's it's more the churn and and having a way to prevent the churn um, and you know Kevin talked a little bit about paying them better having a more realistic work environment and that kind of thing how many of these, you, you're talking about committee changes and some of the things that don't even necessarily require a law, um, uh, whether it be the, the staff cap, you know, potentially raising the staff cap, or whether it be some of the internal uh, changes uh, in your work, how, how many of these things are sort of just pie in the sky theoretical things that you, talk, you, you end up talking about internally? And how, how often do you see Congress actually taking these the, the steps to, to make some of these changes? I mean, is it, I guess, Underlying the question is is the feeling in the news that a lot of times it feels feels a little bit hopeless and like how do you begin to tackle this? Um, but on the ground as you're doing this work, I mean, are are these changes happening? I do you see progress. Are they are they being implemented? Yeah, uh, baby steps. Um, I mean, bad news sells better than good news. Yeah. So the bad news on Capitol Hill is way overreported and the good news is way underreported. Um, very few of us have opened a newspaper or hopped on a news website and seen something, a story on uh, say, yesterday Congress voted and passed uh, you know, three pieces of legislation that would deal with these complex minor policy issues which none of you are familiar with, or Congress, you know, approved three nominees to important positions. That these stories don't get told to the average American. No, it's the stories of strife and people yelling at each other and government shutdowns and that sort of stuff. That's what we tend to see. We um, we did see some good signs of legislative renewal. Very very small stuff in the past year. Um, I mentioned the, the very small 
pat pay increase. Um, my former agency, CRS, was also given a, a, you know, a little bit of extra money to help make up for some of the slide um, in money over the, over the past 10 years. Uh, small things, um, but nobody reported on them. So uh, we at uh, ledgebranch.com actually wrote a piece called, uh, I believe it was uh, Eight Good Pieces of News from Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. <laughs> because we just were just shocked that it was not out there and yeah. we intend to kind of like continue to encourage Congress to do good things. But when they do good things, we want to call attention to it because they need credit. It's actually the, the perfect segue. Um, we we'll take a quick break. I, I want to hear a little bit about uh, the Congressional Management Foundation, the Democracy Awards, which seems to be trying to address some of that lack of good news <laughs> getting out. So uh, you're listening to Fed Talk, Federal News Radio, 1500 AM, and we'll be right back. Make long-term care insurance part of your retirement plan. Long-term care is expensive, and it's not covered by traditional types of insurance plans. With benefits designed specifically for the federal family, the Federal Long-Term Care Insurance Program offers a smart way to help protect savings and assets and remain independent should you need long-term care services someday. Start planning for the future. Take the next step and visit ltcfeds.com today. That's ltcfeds.com. Hey, welcome back to Fed Talk on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I am your host, Ben Carnes, and I'm joined here for our uh, last segment by Kevin Kosar of the R Street Institute and uh, Kathy Goldschmidt of the Congressional Management Foundation. And just before our short break, we were uh, talking about the, the lack of good news, uh, sort of if it bleeds, it leads. The, uh, um, the good news out of Capitol Hill doesn't tend to make it into the news just because it isn't, it isn't the sexy news that, that people want to hear. Um, I know the Congressional Management Foundation is, uh, I think it's a new initiative, the Democracy Awards, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and can you tell us a little bit about that? I know it, it, it's sort of striving to actually get at that problem and, and get some of the good news from Capitol Hill out into the public. Exactly, um, because there is a lot of good on Capitol Hill. And so through the Democracy Awards, we're focusing on non-legislative accomplishments of congressional offices. So we're focusing on um, an award for constituent service, Award, an award for a workplace environment, an innovation award, an award for transparency and accountability, and a lifetime achievement award. And we'll be um, presenting those to congressional offices and staff in um, next July, next June or July, uh, to coincide with the you know, Independence Day and the birth of our country. Um, and we are really hoping to begin to change the, narr the narrative in the public to highlight some of the good things that are happening, as well as give other congressional offices um, models for implementing their own. Because one of the problems on Capitol Hill, as I said, it's a federated, um, a federation of small businesses, and there's not a lot of um, sharing of good practice among the offices, and there's nobody in the institution, in either the House or the Senate, to help offices with you know identify and implement best practices. And so we're hoping that through the awards, um, we promote some of that. It's a great initiative. I, uh, in some of my non-radio show uh, related work, just having seen um, working with uh, with agencies and, and executives, some of whom have, have done incredible things and have maybe saved you know uh, the government a couple billion dollars with some efficiency that they were able to implement. And it has consistently been the same sort of thing. Just, just shocking that the news is not out there. How do you, how do you not highlight the fact but that the, this happened? Uh, so, we're, our democracy awards are modeled a little bit on the Sammys by mm -hmm. the Partnership for Public Service, which does try to highlight the public servants who are doing great things from within government to help the country in so many ways. Yeah, and like, uh, likewise, yeah, we have the, the um, uh, Presidential Rank Awards project that that's coming up. Uh, the, the same thing. Very uh, Im impressive biographies and accomplishments that. Uh, somehow just never make it out because they're 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 not appealing and that that sort of ties into uh, something Kevin you were talking about which is in, in the in the private sector obviously if you're just you're working for a company and you you save the company a couple billion dollars and you're you're not recognized for that or you're not you're not somehow uh, awarded for that or or, or, or um, uh, praised for that. Uh, it, it, you're probably not going to stick around very long. And for some reason, we don't seem to have that concept when it comes to government. They're not real people. It's just this sort of nebulous thing that, that exists. Uh, 
And so how do you how, how do you begin to address that? And uh, is it just just as simple as, as recognizing uh, the accomplishments that are that are occurring, or or what are the steps that you take to improve that? Yeah, certainly for for members of Congress now, if you put yourself in in their shoes, um, the incentives do not lie in the direction of uh, good governance. Mm -hmm. Um, Your first duty when you get to Washington is to um, figure out what party leadership wants and try to go along with it as much as possible because otherwise um, they can make you um, suffer Mm -hmm. one way or another. You then have to raise money to get reelected, keeping an eye if you're on the left from for somebody who's farther left who might primary you, or if you're on the right, for somebody who's farther right who might uh, come after you. Um, you have to do a lot of public relations, a lot of time making speeches, uh, flying back home to meet with constituents so that you, so you can't be accused of catching Potomac fever and becoming a D.C. <laughs> insider and all that. Um, you spend you know time worrying about your social media account. Mm -hmm. You spend time repeating talking points. Um, You spend time reacting to reporters uh, shoving microphones in front of you. Um, That doesn't leave a whole lot of time for governing. I know CMF uh, had a great survey. They've got a lot of great surveys, but one of them, I think it showed something like the average member of Congress saying something like at most 15% per week of their time is spent on policy and oversight. The rest is covered by everything else. Mm -hmm. Um, we need to give them incentives to do their job as opposed to doing this other stuff. And that's where uh, these these awards, I think, are one step in that direction because members of Congress, when they do good stuff, nobody pats them on the back. Um, and do do the, you know, uh, some of the uh, process fixes that you guys are working on, um, does the the improvement, for for example, uh, going back to just my my own experience of, of feeling like the the only place I could ever get information often was it was those talking points, the people who had the time to do the work, and um, I, I had maybe an hour to, to turn something around. You know, I, I so I'm going to to pull from um, from where I can, um, but the inevitable effect of that seems to be this entrenchment almost of partisanship because you've got the Democratic staffers pulling from from their talking points and the Republican staffers pulling from their talking points. Um, by making these institutional fixes, does the the improvement and sort of the, the balancing of power away from just the, this party structure, does that naturally follow? Or is that a separate uh, thing that requires its own? Um, you know, how, how do you get at that? The, the amount of time spent fundraising, the, the amount of power that the, the party ends up having over uh, the individual members who they, they feel, the members feel beholden to them. Um, how do you start fixing that the particular relationship? Well, I could certainly speak to the informational aspect Mm -hmm. of that. Um, I mean, Congress is involved in everything. So if you imagine you're a member of Congress and you show up and suddenly people are asking you about every topic under the sun, of course you're not going to have a clue. And you're going to look to your staff and be like, you know, I don't understand this question about oceanography policy or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Or what's this talk about this treaty? Or what's this business about postal service regulations and mailers? And your staff, of course, they're regular Americans who've just shown up and they're like, well, we don't know. So where do they go? Well, you don't want them only going to partisan sources. You Mm -hmm. want to have a robust environment around them that provides good information. And that's where the GAO and the CRS Mm -hmm. and the CBO um, and even, you know, some of the think tanks. I mean, that's one of the things we're trying to do with the Ledge Branch Capacity Working Group is to present useful information, trustworthy information. Uh, We want to be able to connect congressional staff with experts who know a topic and don't have a skin in the game, but simply they just know it and they're happy to share their advice. Um, So that's one aspect of this. And from our perspective, another aspect of it is the um, connection between their constituents and the members of Congress. And right now we say that they're listening so hard they're going deaf because of all the communication that's coming at them. But by helping citizens better understand how Congress works and, and what it's for and hopefully trying to change the narrative around Congress that it's all filled with 
you know, fat cats who are corrupt, who don't want it to work because it helps line their pockets for it to be this way, isn't true at all. Um, they want to hear from their constituents and want to be better connected. And if they're better connected and can come back to leadership and say, this is what's happening in my district or in my state, um, you know, I, I can't do that, <laughs> you know, that you're, or we need to think about it in this other way. Um, that that can help. And the media is part of it too. The narrative needs to change in the media and that's not our, our, uh, what we yeah, do, yeah. but I know the democracy fund is one of our funders and they are focusing on media and trying to help change the narrative. And I, I guess the, the, the question is, is maybe just a little bit cynical. I mean, there, there, there has to be some presumption that there is a, a desire on the part of the actual lawmakers to ultimately do good <laughs> that, that is, I guess, sort of necessary there. But um, we've got about uh, four or five minutes left, so I, I just wanted to give uh, an opportunity here. We talked briefly about the Democracy Awards, uh, and so when, when is that happening? Uh, is, is there a program? There's an actual program associated with it, or um, there? Yes, there is. Okay. So we're accepting nominations from congressional offices right now, and um, we have a process by which former members of Congress and former staffers will be reviewing um, the nominations and. Um, Selecting the finalists, and um, and then also, and then a different group will find uh, identify the winners. We'll announce the finalists in January, and the winners will be announced in June, the end of June, early July next year. Okay, and the, are you were pulling that information from? Is that coming largely from congressional staff, or who are the, yes, the voting? Yes, from nominations, okay. um, and then we're going to investigate them to to get supporting evidence um, for the best. Okay. Uh, and Kevin, you have the legislative uh, branch capacity working group, which is it's a monthly meeting. Is yep. that correct? And that is it. Uh, is it that's open to the public or uh, I know it, it largely caters obviously to staff and r reporters and members. Um, uh, but what, what, what how can people find out more about it? And uh, sure. Uh, yes, there are monthly meetings. The only months we skip are August and uh, December because nobody would show up during those months. Um, but we usually have them around 12 o'clock in the middle of the month, but the specifics on what dates and what topics we're, we're tackling uh, can be found on our site, LegBranch, L-E-G-B-R-A-N-C-H dot com. And uh, usually we provide free lunch and yeah, it's congressional staff, it's uh, think tankers, it's members of the public. And the idea is that we're all getting together to, to look at one particular topic and to just try to expand our minds a bit and understand, you know, how does this work? Uh, is it working optimally? What are the options for changing it? Uh, and this is an ongoing thing. We're going to just keep doing these lunches forever because we figure the problem is big enough that you could never stop talking about it and thinking about it. And it really, I mean, it's it's always uh, been to me those, those meetings uh, sort of an encouraging antidote to to see right and left uh, come together at the meetings. You know, uh, with the end goal of just how can we actually do this better? And so it's it's sort of encouraging that it. Uh, has taken off. Do you uh, is there a um, currently a theme for the next uh, ledge branch meeting? Um, we're actually the the, we're actually we just had one this week uh, uh, that focused on the um, the appropriations process and the kind of calls that we returned to regular order, uh, where we kind of took a look at why it's difficult to do regular order in a highly polarized mm -hmm. environment. Uh, and right now we're noodling over what the next topic will be. Possibly it might be the kind of changing um, power and authority of the speaker and majority leader, which is uh, is a role that has evolved greatly over time. Or we might take something else up, but we'll make a decision in the next week or two. Well, just to give uh, one last plug in the, the final few seconds here, um, is Kevin Kosar, R Street Institute, uh, it's a legislative branch capacity working group, uh, and that's ledgebranch.com. Uh, and then Kathy Goldschmidt of the Congressional Management Foundation, uh, and they are working on the, the Democracy Awards and uh, their new study on the state of Congress. Um, so those are uh, definitely both worth uh, checking out. And thank you. I thank you both so much for, for joining me and, uh, and talking a little bit this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this has been Fed Talk on Federal News Radio, uh, 1500 AM. That's all the time we have for today. And Fed Talk is brought to you by the Federal Employment Law Firm of uh, Shaw, Bransford, and Roth. Thanks for joining us and have a good weekend. 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 For joining us and have a good weekend.